Hello and welcome to Coiled. Today you're going to learn what pathophysiological processes happen in stroke, what is cytotoxic edema, what is vasogenic edema, what is vasospasm, what is the timing of some of these processes, and learn bits and pieces about treatment. brain consists of 100 billions of neurons. At least that is what some papers say, but I am sure that you understand that it is a very rough estimate. Unfortunately, neuronal tissue and specifically neurons die off much faster than any other cells in the body. The brain tissue needs continuous perfusion, and if the heart stops pumping, as for example in ventricular fibrillation, then every second counts. Some papers say that in the first minute of no brain perfusion, we lose 2 millions of neurons. Some papers talk even about 12 millions of neurons. Nonetheless, neuronal death rate enormously increases after this first minute of no perfusion. Actually, there is a 10 minute rule that says that the brain dies after 10 minutes of no perfusion. But this rule is very unprecise, because many brains die even earlier. Maybe a bit better rule is to imagine that for every minute of no perfusion, 10% of the brains will die. Thus, in the first minute, 10% of brains die. In the second minute, 20%. In the fifth minute, 50%. And this continues to 10 minutes where all brains should be dead. And naturally, these percentages assume normal neuronal metabolic rate. And metabolic rate of the brain cells is crucial because we can affect this by cooling down the brain. And with this, we can dramatically decrease the cell energy expenditure and that means that neurons will save more ATP and this can dramatically prolong their survival. If we cool down brain to 20 degrees of Celsius, the brain is able to survive without perfusion for about 40 minutes. No wonder that this is used in surgeries where you need to stop circulation for longer time. Also, nowadays, mild cooling of hypoxic newborns to about 33 degrees for several days is becoming a standard of neonatal care. So simply said, cooling down the brain that is not getting enough perfusion, that's getting ischemic, or not getting only enough of oxygen, that's getting only hypoxic, will prolong the brain's survival time. In contrast to this, warming up the brain when it is ischemic or only hypoxic will kill it much faster. That is also why one has better chance surviving drowning in cold water than in jacuzzi. And now we are going to go through the pathophysiological processes that are triggered when the ATP supplies are depleted and thus lead to CNS cell death, or in other words, stroke. And naturally, we cannot go through all of them. Rather, I will stress those that I think are important and also easily explainable, that you get an idea what is happening in the stroke region. So first, let's divide these processes into two groups. One group is about the processes that happen within the neuronal cell. Thus, we can call these intrinsic. And the other group of processes is in connection with vessels. And because these processes happen within the extracellular space, we can call these extrinsic. 
Well, let's go first through the intrinsic processes that lead to neuronal cell impairment or cell death. And by the way, most of these processes are general for all the cells in the body. But please, be aware, because I will also mention one of the processes that is rather specific for neurons. So, all starts with decreased levels of ATP due to ischemia or pure hypoxia. Cells need ATP to keep the ion pumps and other intracellular homeostatic mechanisms running. And if there is not enough of ATP, these mechanisms will start to fail. And the first pathophysiological process that I want you to remember, and that is also general for all the cells in the body, is called cytotoxic edema. And this edema happens when the sodium ion levels abnormally increase in the cells. And this is because the NAK pumps are not getting enough of ATP to keep pumping three sodium ions out of the cell in exchange for two potassium ions that move into the cell. And when this happens, the sodium concentration in the cell increases and thus sucks the water into the cell, causing the cytotoxic edema of the cell. So that was about increased intracellular sodium. And now let's get to pathophysiological processes that are related to intracellular increases of another ion, and that is calcium. Normally the cytoplasmic concentration of calcium should be 10,000 times smaller than extracellular. And this low level of cytoplasmic calcium is kept by many different cellular ion transporters that are immediately dealing with transitory cytoplasmic calcium increases. Among many transporters, we can name direct ATP-dependent calcium pumps, pumping back calcium into the endoplasmatic reticulum or out of the cell. Moreover, on the cytoplasmic membrane, there are also ion exchangers driven not directly by ATP, but indirectly by an influx of sodium ions in an exchange for calcium. And again, if the cell has not enough of ATP, all these calcium transporters will start to fail and the cytoplasmic concentration of calcium will increase. And this is a serious problem for the cell because intracellular calcium has many intracellular functions as being a crucial second messenger, activator of many intracellular enzymes, and also a trigger of the neurotransmitter release. And that is also why increased intracellular calcium will trigger many pathophysiological processes. And the first process that I want to point out is the one that is very specific to nerve cells. And why? because this process is triggered by massive release of glutamate. And this massive release continuously activates the postsynaptic neurons to fire uncontrollable burst of action potentials. And because every action potential is energy dependent, this enormous firing drains all the energy from the neuron until the neuron dies. And this process that is triggered by excitatory neurotransmitters and is specific for the nerve cells is called excitotoxicity. Another pathophysiological process I want to point out and is triggered by increased intracellular calcium is uncontrollable activation of intracellular enzymes, as for example lipases and proteases, that will digest the cell from inside. And still, I could mention one more detrimental process that is related to increased intracellular calcium, and that is production of oxygen reactive species that happens predominantly in mitochondria and triggers apoptosis. Well, and finally, speaking of mitochondria and apoptosis, we should also not forget on the direct apoptotic effect of energy shortage that is mediated by apoptotic factors generated in mitochondria. So to recap these intrinsic pathophysiological processes, if there is not enough of ATP, 
The intrasolar sodium increases and causes cytotoxic edema. Not enough of energy also causes increases of intracellular calcium that triggers many processes, as massive glutamate release that causes excitotoxicity, activation of intracellular enzymes, and production of reactive oxygen species. And the last process that you could remember is the direct production of apoptotic factors by an energy depleted mitochondria. So these are some of the intrinsic processes that at the end lead to neuronal death. So those were the intrinsic pathophysiological processes. And now let's get to the extracellular ones. And again, there are many more processes happening in the extracellular space, but we will go through the two that I suggest are the most important ones. And these two processes, as was already mentioned, are in close relation to vessel function. And the first process that impairs brain function and commonly leads to brain death is related to the functionality of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier basically consists of three layers. Inner layer is made of capillary endothelial cells. Middle is made by basal lamina with pericytes. And the outer layer is made by astrocyte and feet. And these layers work as a virtual semi-permeable membrane that selectively permits, through passive and also active transports, only selected ions and macromolecules to get into the interstitial fluid of the brain. Unfortunately, the blood-brain barrier starts to break down about three to six hours after the stroke. And as it breaks down, it loses its semi-permeable features and starts to get leaky. And at this point, many other osmotically active substances that are not normally present in interstitial fluid, as for example albumin, get into the interstitial space. And because these substances are osmotically active, they are followed by water, causing interstitial edema. And because this edema happens due to leakage of fluids from the capillaries, we call this pathophysiological process vasogenic edema. And as already said, the vasogenic edema starts about three to six hours after the stroke and peaks up about three to five days later. So the maximal leakage of the proteins and water into the interstitial space happens on average four days after the stroke. That also means that people with stroke can very much worsen on these days because of this vasogenic edema. The second mechanism that can very much worsen the outcome is the vasospasm of the cerebral arteries. And this happens when the blood gets into the extravascular space. The presence of blood extravascularly itself can trigger vasoconstriction of the nearby vessels. In other words, when blood gets out of the arteries and touches them from the outside, the blood and its byproducts start to continuously irritate the arteries that commonly react with massive and uncontrollable local vasospasm. And when blood gets into the extravascular space, well, definitely during hemorrhagic strokes. But interestingly, some types of hemorrhagic strokes are more prone for vasospasms and some are less. For example, in a typical intraparenchymal hemorrhage, there is a very low probability that it will trigger a serious arterial vasospasm. In contrast to this, subarachnoid bleedings and specifically those due to aneurysmal rupture are typically associated with massive artery vasospasms that can dramatically worsen the patient's prognosis. And how? Well, because the vasospasms are so massive that they cause serious secondary ischemia or even secondary ischemic strokes in the regions of the brain that are supplied by these spastic arteries. <music> 
And how is it with the vasospasm dynamics? Well, the vasospasm peaks somewhere between 7th and 10th day after the aneurysmal rupture. And because the vasospasm is so dangerous and also typical for aneurysmal bleeding, remember that the patient should be within 48 hours after the rupture treated with nimodipine, a calcium channel blocker to preventively blunt the severity of the vasospasm. Moreover, the treatment with nimodipine should continue for another three weeks after the rupture. So if we look at these two extracellular pathophysiological processes, the thing I want you to realize is that these can turn out as very serious complications that happen several days after the stroke. And although we mention some time peaks, when these happen, do not forget that these can cause serious damage earlier than these graphs show. For example, deadly vasospasm can be present already on the fourth day after the aneurysmal rupture. The other thing I want you to remember is that yes, vasospasm is very typically connected with subarachnoid bleedings. But in contrast to this, vasogenic edemas can complicate not only strokes, but also traumatic brain injuries, CNS tumors, CNS infections, and many more. Thus, you should look on vasospasm as a rather very specific complication of subarachnoid hemorrhages, and in contrast to this, you should take vasogenic edema as a very general complication of many other CNS conditions, therefore not only strokes. So finally, if we look at these processes, all of them lead directly or indirectly to one thing, and that is brain edema. And because skull is a closed container, the swollen brain has no place to expand, and thus the intracranial pressure, which is the pressure of the extravascular space, steeply increases. And when the intracranial pressure increases, then the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the pressure that drives the blood flow into the brain, has to decrease. And when the cerebral perfusion pressure decreases to a certain point, the perfusion of the brain stops and brain death occurs. So simply said, all the deadly CNS processes lead to brain edema. And brain edema is the last thing that we are trying to deal with. And okay, not in all, but in many cases, we can try to revert this deadly process by opening the container and thus immediately decreasing the intracranial pressure. And the thing that we can do is decompressive craniectomy. That means taking out as large as parts of the temporoparietal occipital regions of the skull as possible and opening the dura mater to let the brain expand. And if the edema is one-sided, we perform only unilateral craniectomy. If the whole brain is swollen, we perform bilateral decompressive craniectomy. Nonetheless, you should take this procedure as read the last try of hope than a treatment with good outcome. So, if you want to find out what is cerebral perfusion pressure, just check the lecture on brain death. And if you want to know something about treatment of the aneurysmal rupture, just check the lecture on subarachnoid bleeding. So, thanks for watching. And do not forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, check the description below for supplementary questions and other stuff.